welcome to the show. Another episode of Tennessee Wildcast, the weekly podcast for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Of course, you can listen to us, just listen to us, and some of you probably are. Yep. Or you can watch Jason. You can go out and watch it. You can can watch us. You can watch us, yeah. Right there on TWRA TV or YouTube or all over the place. Hey, this show's all about you. It's all about our resources, which we know that you enjoy and that's why you would be watching or listening to us and we're going to keep bringing these programs to you so you can learn more about your state of tennessee and the outdoors opportunities and speaking of that hold your boy tucker is four years old four years old so tucker is still at least five years and we'll find out for sure away from taking something called hunter education right and you do plan for him to take hunter education he will take hunter education he's got his lifetime license right now and we're going to get in the woods this year anyway, though. Was that because of Grandma and Grandpa? Or was that yeah. Of that? Not even Poppy pitched in on that one. Did they? That's a great gift for him to have. Well, anyway, Tucker's a few years away from that, but he'll be taking it one day. And mm-hmm. listen, Hunter Education is our subject today. We're going to talk about it. And, and we got uh, the expert with us today. We do. And if you never go hunting, or if you don't think your son or daughter will ever go hunting, you still should consider uh, Hunter Education because everyone should know how to handle a firearm and know about safety so that they don't grow up being scared of a firearm because there's nothing to be scared of. Nope, they're good things. They are. All right, let's widen out and introduce Randy Husky. Yeah. Randy Husky is our guest today. A lot of folks have seen this face through the years, doing a lot of different <laughs> stuff. Randy is. Randy has probably been in front of more people than he'll ever know already, and he's got a long way to go. But Randy is the statewide hunting education administrator uh, for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and he also served recently, or maybe you still are, as president I just, uh, I'm serving as immediate past president right now. Of the National Hunter Education Inter- International Hunter Education Association. International. IHEA. Yeah. Wow, I bet that paid you big bucks. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I know. I understand. But that's still a great honor, Randy, for, for somebody to it was. in a position like it was. that. That's and it awesome. Was, it was a great experience as well. All right. Randy, you are head of the, the Hunter Education Program across the state, and you've served, um, I I'm not sure where you started. What would you? Where did you start with the agency, and how did you work up to this position? I was. I started out as a wildlife officer in Monroe County, uh, and I worked there for about 15 years as an officer. Um, then I moved to Nashville um, and became the uh, statewide turkey and, and trapping fur bear coordinator. Okay. For a couple of years, and and then the hunter education position uh, was open, and I was lucky enough to get that. And here you are. Yeah. All right, and you work up. Uh, not this is a little bit of internal stuff, but you work out of the law enforcement vision for TWA. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Mm-hmm. All right, and you also do a lot of training for the agency. You work with yes. Ken Reedy and train a lot of the new officers coming in, and, and the veteran officers too, I assume, right? Yes, absolutely. But, okay. All right. Well, the subject today is hunter education, Jason, and I'm here to tell you that there will be somebody that goes out when this deer season starts, and they will fall from a tree stand, even though people like Randy have been telling them for decades long before randy to do <laughs> yes. all the safety precautions to wear those harnesses when you're to do everything properly but somebody will ignore it they'll fall out of the tree stand if it doesn't kill them it'll paralyze them yeah, yeah. Every, every year we have that uh, doug yeah, it's it's a common occurrence and in all those instances the person just does not wear a, a full body harness fall that's, that's all it takes it's so easy <laughs> and it's so inexpensive right that's all it takes and, and in the few cases that somebody does have the full body harness on they don't hook up from the time they leave the ground to the time they get back. Yeah. There's a period of ascending and descending of the tree where they unhook that tree stand from the, from the lifeline or something that would just take a few seconds, a few extra seconds to do. It, it, and it doesn't, you may think that you're five feet up in the air and it's not very far, but when you're falling, say you're just 200 pounds and you fall and that 200 pounds hits the ground, five feet up, you can do massive damage. Yeah, that, that causes a lot, of, uh, a lot of damage to the body when you fall from, from, from any height, especially... You know as well as I do, when you fall, you have no control of how you're going to land or where you're going to land. That's right. That's right. And I have have talked to guys in the past. The ones that will talk to you the the first a lot of times are the ones that have – they knew better. They're not 15 or 20 or 25. They're 50-year-old men. Yes. Nothing's ever happened to them. They decide to get a little lazy. They go up there, and the tree limb snaps they've been sitting on or climbing up on all these years. And they fall to the ground, they bust themselves up bad and embarrasses them, but they're the ones that will come out and tell you, I didn't do it right. Right, they will. And so, some of our our absolute best instructors have been victims of tree stand accidents. They, they didn't wear their harness or, or they were using a homemade tree stand or something not safe. Uh, and that's another precaution people should take is, is not, not to use those homemade tree stands. Uh, they can be dangerous over time. Uh, 
the nails or screws can work out of the wood. The wood becomes rotted. Um, it's just, just don't safe. do it. And uh, you can buy a tree stand, what, for $99 yeah, and a harness stand exactly, or something like that. Exactly. So, yeah, come on, guys. So do it right. And we're going to get into a lot of stuff like that. And we're also going to work with Randy on telling you how to get your child into a hunter education course in Tennessee. Because this is the time of year, Randy, where they, they're offered year-round. But right now is when they're offered a lot year-round. Yes. Yeah, it's, this is our, our busy time, as we like to call it, during hunter education, right before turkey season, right before hunting season. Uh, we're offering a lot of classes right now. Uh, September, October, there'll be a lot of classes available. Are they offered? Tennessee has 95 counties. Will there be hunter education in all 95 counties? Yes, every county will have a class at some time during the year, uh, and most of them will have multiple classes. And the other thing is if you're sitting on a county line somewhere and there's not a class being offered in your county, can you go across that line and, and take that course over Absolutely, there? absolutely. Yeah. And that's kind of the way we designed our system. Uh, of course, it's an online registration system now for the students. Um, and you simply type in your uh, zip code, and it'll tell you the closest class to your zip code. Well, let's go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, let's we'll go ahead and, and show that to everyone. This is how easy it is to get your child in hunter education. And two things real quick before we go through it, Randy. Does hunter education cost anything? No, it's absolutely free. Okay. Now, there is something called an online course that we'll talk about in a minute. Yes. But if you're mm -hmm. talking about going to a physical, traditional class, it doesn't cost you anything. Our, our traditional 11-hour course, which is a classroom course taught by volunteer instructors, of course, uh, it's absolutely free. There's no cost. Okay. And the other thing, your son or daughter, grandson, granddaughter, next door neighbor, whatever you go with, can you go with them as an older adult? Yeah. It's actually encouraged. Um, you, know, you know, the instance may come up where you have an opportunity to go out and hunt another state. And, and some other states uh, True. require hunter education regardless of age. There, boy. Do we still get those calls? The guy that's going out west of one yeah. of the states, 19, you got to been, if you were born after 1949, which most people are now or getting yeah. that way, yeah. you have to head hunter education exactly exactly and, and a lot of times they don't realize that until maybe the week before they're leaving and, and there's not a lot Get me in there <laughs> there's, yeah. yeah there's not a lot we can do at that and, point and i think even now too you can correct me is it fort campbell or land between lakes one of them now requires you also to have mandatory hunter education? yeah all military if you're hunting military property fort campbell uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely required it don't matter it don't how matter what are. your age is exactly all right but otherwise for the other time where, where it's what is the mandatory date in tennessee just for your kids that are coming up, where does it start? As far as age? Uh, we, as far as age and what okay. year? What's the year going back? Well, far? we will certify a student when they turn nine years of age. Okay. Uh, they have to have it when they nine turn years. 10. <laughs> yeah. Jason, right. yeah, got that. Nine, <laughs> nine years. Nine years. <laughs> uh, they have to have it when they turn 10. Uh, and anyone born after January 1st, uh, 1969, has to have it. And that's getting on up there now. Yeah, so that's, that's right there on our website, too. Yeah. You can't, you can't miss it. Yeah, it's right there. All right. That's well into the 40s Good. years old now, right? Yeah. That's, oh, uh, like, that's my good. age. <laughs> yeah, all right. We won't tell them that. All that's right. you were 21. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Let's, let's, do, let's walk them through. This is, uh, this is tnwildlife.org, tnwildlife.org. Mm -hmm. yes. Our website, if you can't find it that way, just put Tennessee Wildlife in your search box, and you'll find it. And once you get there, what'd you pull down, for hunters? Yeah, for hunters. Hunter education is under four hunters. You can see that at the top of the page there. Click on hunter education. Scroll down a few few blocks here, all the necessary information is there and then you got find a class near you that block you just click that and it takes you to the location to search for a class in your area okay scroll that up a little bit sure and then you can it tells you when the class is what time how many days and randy i heard you say 11 hours mandatory so we're looking yes. at uh, at least two days of classes a lot of them are taught on weekends or if not they're caught what like a tuesday wednesday tuesday yeah wednesday. A, a lot of them doug will go monday tuesday a lot of them will skip wednesday uh, thursday friday and finish up on a saturday morning typically. okay all right, let's show them that um, next uh, step then, too. Okay, so if we select this one, Mount Carmel Baptist Church, and um, Signal Mountain, it'll take you to the spot where you got all the details about it. Yeah, it'll, it'll show you the meeting dates. It'll explain all that. Um, it, it actually tell you how many seats are remaining. Uh, that way you know. I love that. That's yeah. great. It'll let you know if there's, uh, if there's room available in the class. Did you do that, Randy? Did you add that? <laughs> that's actually been uh, we've had that on our system for a while now okay scroll it on up a little bit all right so click right here to register right there it's this, this, this easy bottom right hand corner and fill it out and then there you fill out your fill out your form yep just fill out your information um and just review, review it and confirm it and you're there and you're there so you, you don't have to call the agency anymore you don't have to call the agency and actually you'll get an email sent to you confirming your registration and and uh, you can actually confirm that again to absolutely uh Say you're coming for you, absolute sure. Do you, 
you like to know if they're not coming. This yes. thing can fill up, and if yes. you take a spot and don't go, you're taking it from somebody you else. You are, you are, and that happens a lot. But uh, with this new system, I actually get sent uh, like a couple of days prior to class, I'll so get another email sent to them reminding them that class is, is coming up the next day or two. Okay, and you don't get in trouble if you back out of it. No, we'll offer no, more and just take it, but just let somebody that needs to take it yes. uh, take it and so they can. And then, all right, after they take the traditional inside core, and I want to I talk to you some more about these stats you got, but also what goes on in the course. But after they take that course, are there still field days they have to go to? Uh, no, when they take when it are you talking about the online? No, course? Yeah, no, okay. no, no. Let me back up. The traditional course, are there still a shooting day, not a field day? They still have to go shoot. Yeah, then that's typically done on that last day on that Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. They'll go do a live fire exercise, which is uh, sometimes pellet guns, sometimes twenty two rifles, sometimes shotguns. Uh, and it's not to see how accurate you can fire a firearm. That's not what it's about. It's to see how safely you handle a firearm. See, if that's you listen in class, for. right? Exactly. And that's, that's what it's about. And there's a test at the end of the course, too, right? To there see. is. There's a 100-question multiple-choice test. Um, and, and you know, most people pass that. Okay. Test. And what are they issued once they pass? They get a certificate of graduation from our program of completion of the course. And they get a card, a little wallet card. That everybody's encouraged to laminate as soon as they get it. Because it might fall apart. It is not washer-proof <laughs> <laughs> whatsoever. And you'll be calling us and saying, what do I do to have to get another one? Yeah. And since we're there and since somebody's probably been through that, what do you have to do if you if you lose your Well, you can, you can call the regional office and request a, a, a duplicate card. It's I think it's 7 bucks to get a duplicate card. Okay. All right. It was easy as that, but I'm with Randy. Laminate that thing. And, yeah. And... Uh, that way exactly. it, it might last you for a long time. Yeah. All right, Randy, let's go ahead and talk about the, the non-traditional class, the okay. online class. What is that? And that does cost a few bucks. It does. It does. Uh, the online courses are were developed, of course, by outside vendors. Private companies develop these courses. And there's a lot of upkeep, and they keep updating these classes all the time. Um, so there's, there is a cost to that. Um, the courses are all – they're heavily, uh, heavily involved from the uh, – perspective of the uh, the vendor mm -hmm. they track that student if there's any questions or anything there's 24 7 support that's just something that we couldn't offer as an agency if we could develop this course but um, they have 24 7 support uh, and they'll track you from the beginning to the end if you have any questions or problems um, and each chapter of course you have to take a test to progress so chapter one you take so a you're test. not going to think you're going to get away no, with you, a thing you can't something. just click through it i mean it's a timed yeah. course you have to stay on each page for a certain set of time yeah uh, at the end of that chapter you take a test and you progress to the next chapter and so forth i mean it's it's really a controlled course and it lasts about seven seven eight hours of online study uh, once you get done you'll get a certificate of completion of that course and, and again uh, most of them you pay at the end when you complete the course that's when you would actually pay and it's typically around twenty five dollars. Okay, and All that's right. something we have no control over. That's an outside vendor. Um, and I'm glad we have that. And that was created because no matter how many courses we offer, there's always somebody that says, I, my, "My son and my daughter just don't have time to go to that because they play baseball, football, name mm -hmm. it, on and on and on and on." Exactly. So that's an opportunity for them to take it there. I, I still believe, as nice as I think this is, and, and I like that it's created, there's nothing that will ever be sitting in a room with Randy Husky or Ken Reedy or Faye Hickerson or these other people across the state have been teaching and all these yes. wonderful volunteers yeah. will never be sitting in there with them and letting them do hands-on with you. It, 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 it doesn't. I kind of like to think of it like going to Walmart. You can buy the brand A, which is the best, or you can buy brand B, which is cheaper, but it's, it's, it'll still get you what you want, but it's just a little cheaper product. Um, I'm not saying that that's cheap, but I understand. You know, it's it's not the best product out there. The best product again is the, the people. traditional course. Yeah, yeah. And, face and, to face. And face you face couldn't face. do this thing without volunteers. This is a volunteer driven. A lot of wildlife officers, of course, they do a great job across the state, but it's also volunteer driven. Many volunteers teach thousands of students every year. Absolutely, yeah. We certify about sixteen to eighteen thousand students a year. We have wow. twelve hundred volunteer instructors that run this. Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred volunteer instructors that's more in than Tennessee. I wow. Yeah. And and those are that's the back that's the backbone of the program. I mean, these guys are highly dedicated. They they essentially you know um, dedicate their life to this cause. Most of them, most of them will teach three, four, five, six classes a year. Some of them will teach twelve to fifteen classes a year. These and, guys are unbelievably dedicated. All right, two things. Why it's still in my head? Uh, once you take the traditional, I mean, the online course, there is a field day for that. Yes, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you take you take the uh, the online course again. Uh, which is a pay course. After that, you get that 
certificate of completion. Mm -hmm. You take that certificate of completion and you find you a field day online. You go to online, you find you a field day, which is about a three to four hour course. You go, you get a review, you take your, your test and you take the live fire uh, portion mm -hmm. of the portion of the of the course and then you're you're certified once again to let you know that that you took that course so mm -hmm. and before it's all over it's still going to be about 11 hours time you do everything yeah yeah by time you do everything. Give or take. all right mm -hmm. and the other thing is while we're talking about volunteers if somebody wants to become a hunter education coordinator for twra what do they do they need to contact the regional office and of course there's an application for that we'll send you an application you'll fill it out send it in of course we do a background check on all our instructors um, and then talk to the county wildlife officer and make sure that um, that that person is not a wildlife violator. <laughs> yeah, okay. teach them the right thing. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, and then uh, y'all, you have a do you have training for them um, somewhere every year? Yeah, they do. We have uh, several uh, hunter education. What we like to call we like to call them academies. Hunter education instructor okay. academies. Uh, they're three day long. They're pretty intense. They're a Friday, Saturday, Sunday deal. Uh, you come in on, on a Friday evening. Mm -hmm. um, Still taught Henry Horton, is that or is that, no, am I getting uh, that mixed up? With, we, we move them around. Do we, do, okay. we do them in East Tennessee. We do them in, in Crossville. We do them in uh, at Bell Buckle. We'll do them in Jackson. We move them around. We want to. We hit do about, everybody. Yeah, we want to hit everybody. That's why we move them around. It makes it a little easier on the instructor. We don't want to have to make them travel so far. But um, okay, and, it, and it's pretty intense. But uh, I feel like as a program administrator, it needs to be pretty in depth. They need to know the policies and procedures, and they need to know what to teach in class all right. it's, it's serious stuff and, and needs it to is. be all right let's talk about what you've got in the the paper in front of you the statistics on there and it might surprise you it's some of what randy's got there's something you've uh, you've compilated here i think you said in the last year or so yes and yeah. start where you want to i mean the, we've talked about the falling from the tree stand and we might want to hit on that a little bit more but what that, are you yeah, finding that, out that that's a big is in, in tree stand uh incidents um, is the victims typically just not wearing the full body harness. Mm -hmm. and that, and that's, that's the big thing. If, if we can get everyone to wear that full body harness, uh, and again, stay away from the single straps and the shoulder straps, those things will absolutely uh, hurt you or, or even kill you. Get, get a good full body harness, and, and people will say, oh, they're $100. Well, you know, <laughs> box ammunition may cost $100 yeah. these days. I mean, so. I have, the, all these years I have – between life jackets and, and safety harnesses, yeah. you feel like a broken record, but you, you, you break the record because you mean what you're saying. And if you wear that life jacket, your chance of living is exactly. just so much greater. And this yeah. harness, too. Remember a few years ago, Randy, and you'll probably remember it well, and it was all here in Middle Tennessee. There were two or three young men, barely in their 20s, fell out of tree stands, and right now somewhere they're in a wheelchair. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. just is – it's a serious business. I mean, you don't want to have a day where you're going out there to have a good time to hunt a deer, end up with the rest of your life yeah. in a wheelchair. Yeah. yeah. We, we've got to the point in Tennessee – this is kind of amazing, Doug. We've got to the point in Tennessee where our volunteer instructors have done such a good job teaching firearm safety that we'll have years that we don't have any firearm-related fatalities in hunting. And that's amazing. But we always have those – tree stand fatalities can't get rid of them it's just and they're I, and they're, they're, they're going up the, that trend's going up there, there's more and more of them every year and firearm re injuries are going down it's just it's amazing i remember even back in the day a guy named norman bates worked for us and yeah. him him talking about how few accidents at the time were the what a lot of people think of the 150 yard shot somebody gets shot that mm -hmm. those are rare that's rare it's these tree stand yeah. accidents yeah. that are frequent and and will mess you up mm -hmm. go ahead randy what else you got um Another thing to, to remember when you're using a tree stand, of course, is to use that haul line as well. Uh, don't climb that tree with, with equipment on your back or, or, or definitely don't climb that tree with a, with a rifle slung over your back. And, and that, that's been the cause of several accidents in Tennessee and even some fatalities. Okay. Um, you don't want that, that firearm falling to the ground and discharging. You don't. Absolutely yeah. not. Okay. Uh, use, use that haul line to haul up all your equipment with. And that, that's the big thing with, with tree stand safety is – is a full body harness and the haul line okay. and, and hooking up that harness from the time you leave to the time you get back down to the ground. All right. Well, what about this orange that, that some most people wear, but sometimes there's a few folks out there that just don't want to wear that 500 inches of orange. What about volunteer orange? Volunteer <laughs> orange. You said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about blaze orange. <laughs> blaze orange. There you go. All right. Uh, 
and you do see that. You see some people wearing orange. It's not really blaze orange. Yeah. So uh, to be sure and get the blaze orange vest and the blaze orange hat, especially mm-hmm. uh, a UT and, hat, and, is and not blaze orange. Wearing a hat's orange. not enough. You'll get a ticket if you just decide yeah. to wear that hat. Mm-hmm. You've got to have the vest and the hat. It's okay. got to be on the upper body and the head. Uh, Five hundred square inches, of course, of blaze orange. Okay, and you said before we started, say so you're saying that folks that aren't wearing them are showing up in your stats somehow. Uh, they are. It's pretty amazing. Uh, we're coming up on deer season, of course, and, and pretty easy, pretty interesting statistic. Uh, I've been looking at all the deer hunting incidents, and half of them are are the, are the direct result of people not wearing a blaze orange vest or hat. Mm-hmm. Half, half ha- of them. Half of our half of our deer hunting. Uh, related firearm related mm-hmm. injuries in Tennessee are the direct result of people not wearing blaze orange. Then that tells me that might tell me something else too. It might also tell me that somebody's shooting at movement and not at seeing their game. Exactly. Okay. And, and that's a biggie. Victim mistaken for game and careless handling of firearms are the two main causes in Tennessee of, of hunting incidents. Well, and well, how, what does the stat show you? How many, how many fatalities have we had in recent years, Randy? Um, whether it would be tree stand or somebody being shot or shooting themselves because they didn't handle their, their firearm properly? Well, in the, in the last six years, um, we've only had five fatalities uh, in Tennessee, okay. which is shooting great. Shooting fatality? Shooting like fatality, it? yeah, shooting yeah. fatality. Firearm-related okay. fatalities in Tennessee, we've only had five. Uh, one of those was a careless hand, handling uh, in, incident fatality, and the other four were victim mistaken for game. Okay. And some of the one of the I think was during turkey season. The other three were during deer season, and and none of those had orange on. All right, I remember one of them here in Middle Tennessee. I think it happened over in Lawrence or Lewis County or whatever, yeah. and, the, and it was mistaken game. Yeah. And so all this stuff that you're telling us, though, it's hammered in. If you're having any hesitation about sending your student to one, of the, all this is hammered in during that course. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, we talk about, um, of course, you know, we got the Ten Commandments of Firearm Safety that we hammer throughout the whole course. Uh, and, and the first one is, is to watch that muzzle. Mm-hmm. And if everybody would just watch that muzzle, these careless handling incidents would totally disappear. And when you say watch the muzzle, you mean point it up, point it down, or what's point the best it, way to point, point it? Point it in a safe direction. A safe, away must, from people. Away from people, and you must determine what that safe direction yeah, that is. That can change no matter where you're at. That, that, can change that safe where direction you're at. changes. Exactly. Okay, what else do you teach like that? What, what uh, the, 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 the safety on a, on a fire, I mean, important, but not... Something. Yeah, you don't you don't rely on that exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you keep it on at all times and keep your finger outside that trigger guard, but you don't rely on that safety because it's it's a mechanical device, and of course, as we all know, mechanical devices can fail or break. And if it fails and your muscle is pointed in a safe direction, you're going to be fine. Everything is good. Yeah, if you all have right. if you accidentally uh, fire that firearm, but your muzzle's pointed in that safe direction, you're going to be fine. That's why that first commandment of firearm safety is so critical and so important and everybody watch that muzzle control that muzzle safe direction and, at all and you may not think you've done it I, I always consider myself pretty safe with firearm but i remember at least a time or two in my life where i discharged it had it pointed in a safe yeah. direction but it yeah. happens more than you think it even does. with experienced people absolutely experienced people i mean that's where the majority of our accidents are happening it's not young, young kids it's the yeah. 40s and 50 year olds that's been hunting all their life it's just mm-hmm. but they're overconfident maybe but yeah okay yeah. maybe right. just get a little careless for a second and that's all it takes all right what else are, are you showing there and, and and things that you might want to talk about well, about we, what we takes got, place we've got dove hunting season coming up uh, real soon very soon yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what type of accidents we're seeing during dove season okay uh, the majority of our dove hunting accidents over 75 percent are, are the result of a victim being in a line of fire. And that's all stemming from people shooting at low birds on fields. Okay. So that's... Don't do it. Don't do it. There no. is no bird out there worth shooting no. at low like that no. with people all hunting around you. So that's where the majority of it comes from yes. on a dove field. On a dove field. So if people could just not shoot that low bird. And again, that's watching the muzzle. You're, you're pointing it at, at somebody. So control that muzzle. Don't, don't be tempted to take that shot at that low bird. It's just a dove. It's just a dove. <laughs> all right. All right. And anything else as far as... Uh, and while we're on Dove, let, let's because it is coming up in a few weeks, Randy. Let's talk talk about not just the safety, but what you have to have on the field. But what else is there? Anything else for safety as far as Dove that you want to discuss? Uh, well, of, of course, uh, you know, be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of who all's around you. Mm-hmm. Know the position of the other hunters in the fields. That's um, that's a great tip. Yeah, yeah it, that's that's critical. Um, and again, guys, don't don't shoot at that low bird you know make sure you're firing up in the air okay and while we're on it randy um people that always they forget this time of year 
that a dove is it's a migratory bird so yeah. when you go out there what tell them about plugging shotguns you, you gotta have that, that plug in your shotgun that thing can't be capable of holding more than three rounds you've got to have it plugged and make sure that make sure that that plugs in there and that's on migratory birds migratory birds yeah. so okay remember and that is a migratory bird and also I, well when you can hunt doves depending on what field you're on but if you go out with doves you can use you can use lead shot in this case right yes with dove yeah, okay probably. and if you get on a, a one of those few areas that require steel shot keep that in mind mm -hmm. i don't know how many of we got across the state and, and since we're there too just want to remind everyone that, that yeah. the agency will be putting up all its fields on our website tnwildlife.org all the fields that we're going to be that are either public that we manage or, or that our teams have been managing all year and then right. we'll put lease fields out there too and those lease fields may not even be posted till a day or two before the season begins but there'll be a lot of fields out there. yeah just come back to the website and watch for the updates tnwildlife.org and okay, i'm sure right. we'll throw it out on facebook and twitter as well we will we'll put it out on our social media it'll be there <laughs> all right randy what else you got <laughs> I got something else I'd like to talk about. It when I was compiling these stats, something other, something else popped out at me. Um, you know, everybody thinks about a hunting incident as as you going out hunting and somebody shooting you that you don't know, somebody just out of the wild, somebody stuck on your property and shot you. Uh, that's typically not the case. Okay. If, you, if we look at the incidents in Tennessee, uh, most of them you're either shot by your hunting partner, or you're or it's self inflicted. That's the vast majority of our incidents in Tennessee. So, so your partner's walking alongside you, doesn't have his muzzle pointed in a safe direction, trips on something or whatever, crossing a fence, whatever. Exactly, and exactly. You. Or um, some people get the great idea to try to drive deer toward each other or even drive turkeys toward each other. And and uh, for whatever reason, they may take off their orange vest or something and, and their partner shoots them coming through the brush back toward them. That's happened on several them, occasions. Oh, me. They I get can't so imagine excited. That. Yeah. Oh, golly, no thank you. That typically don't work. But <laughs> Yeah. All right, and the other is self-inflicted. And how do most people self-inflict, shoot themselves? Uh, most of them are a result of loading and unloading. They'll rest that firearm on their foot or on their leg or whatever when they're unloading their firearm, and, and things go wrong from there. Do you, you see that with like, crossing fences and things like that too, or you do. crossing creeks? Crossing and, fences, or, or actually, guys, also lo lo leaning that firearm up against a truck or a tree, and the thing will fall over. Uh, that, you just gotta be so careful. I think one of the oddest, um, sort of self-inflicted fatalities that I ever remember having to talk about was a, a duck hunter here in Middle Tennessee, yeah, and he I had left a one. shotgun in his boat, yeah. and his Labrador Retriever mm -hmm. stepped on the trigger. Yeah. And killed him right there where he was hunting. So uh, things like that you just got to keep in mind. You don't know what's going to happen. Put that safety back on and yeah. put that gun in a safe spot. Yeah. Or if you're going to be away from it, unload it. It takes a second. It doesn't take any it. time. Yeah. It doesn't take any time at all. Exactly. All right, Randy, what else are your stats telling us and what time? How much we got left there, Jason? Oh, we got about three minutes. Okay. All right. A little less. You got something else in there that you'd like to, to tell them before we have to get out of here? Well, let's... Uh, Again, just looking at our incidents across the state, uh, the big three again are, are uh, accidents occurring during deer hunting season, dove hunting season, and turkey season. So that's that's when we see the majority of our injuries. Of course, that's when most people hunt, of course, as well. I mean, there's more deer hunters and turkey hunters than any other thing probably, but uh, that's where we're seeing the majority of our incidents. So when you're out there, be extra vigilant, be extra careful. Um, and, and just take all the necessary precautions. And why, why are that orange, guys? Um, it doesn't, doesn't take any time at all. And no. if somebody wants to come on, they want to come on to our website and find some of this information, is there, are there some stats or some other information about hunter education out there on our website for them to look at? Uh, they can request it. I can send them any information they want to. They can also go to the International Hunter Education Association website. There's a lot of information on that website exactly. Uh, that will have a lot of, of detailed information. And I'm, I'm glad you said that, Randy, because you, you just, as you said, you're in the past president role there. But what is that group and what's its intentions, what's its goals? The IHEA, of course, they represent all 50 states. It's, it's an association that represents all 50 states in their hunter education program. Um, that association also offers, it offers insurance for instructors. It represents 55,000 instructors throughout the United States. Um, it's just a great organization, a great association to champion the cause of hunter education. And they have their own website. So they have their own there. website, yes. All right, Randy, great job. And uh, wear, wear that orange, as Randy said, and uh, just that, be smart. Wear that harness. Yeah, wear, wear that, that harness. harness. And Randy, right now, again, 
practice is when you need to get in that hunter education. Don't wait till last minute. Go ahead and enroll now and get signed up in the class to ensure your spot right now. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Randy, will be on Facebook this week or maybe next, yeah, this week with a, a Wildcast Extra that you've done. Yeah. All right. He'll be else? on there. That's uh, on Facebook and Twitter, and you can watch and listen to this show at tmwildcast.com. So we're all over check the us place. Out. Your show, everybody. Tell your friends about us and come back. Our show's always out there, but we'll see you with a new show every week. week. Yeah. yeah.